In the previous video, I went through some of the wave basics, things that you need to know about waves. And so far, we've only considered single waves, really, and their properties. But what happens when two waves meet? And this is what the principle of superposition is. So let's look at some examples to see if we can illustrate it, and then we'll come up with the principle. So here we have wave one and wave two. They are in step, they're in phase. They're perfectly synced, they have the same frequency. What is going to happen when those two waves meet? Well, you're going to get a resultant wave that adds together the disturbances of each one. And in this case, because they're perfectly in sync, their crests are in line with each other, their troughs are in line with each other, you're going to end up with a wave that has twice the amplitude, or the amplitude of wave one plus the amplitude of wave two. This is what we call constructive interference, when the resultant wave has a higher amplitude than the waves that make it up. These two waves are in antiphase. In other words, they have half a wavelength path difference, they have 180 degrees or pi phase difference. And you can see here that when wave one is in crest, wave two is in trough, and vice versa. When that crest meets that trough, those, because they're exactly the same amplitude, are going to cancel each other out and you're going to get zero as the resultant wave. And the same thing happens when wave one is in trough and wave two is in crest. Now, of course, you only get this perfectly zero cancellation when the amplitudes of those waves are exactly the same. But the principle is still the same. We're still getting the resulting wave having an amplitude that is the sum of the individuals. It's just that the individuals here have a sum of plus something for the amplitude for wave one and minus something for the amplitude for wave two. And those somethings are the same. Since these waves cancel each other out, this is called destructive interference. Destructive interference doesn't always produce zero waves. It may just be that you have a smaller amplitude than your initial waves. So this is the ideal situation, and you'd have to adapt this principle for whatever conditions you were given. We know now that constructive interference occurs when two waves meet and they are in phase. We also know that they can be in phase at different times. So if you look at these diagrams given here, if these waves were to superpose or to interfere, this is what we call it when two waves meet, then you would get constructive interference. So therefore, we might have a wave that has a path or a phase difference and still constructively interfere because they're still in phase. So waves will be in phase if they're any multiples of 2 pi away from each other. So where n is a whole number here, 2 pi times n the number of wavelengths that separate them. To be an antiphase, you need to have a number of 2n plus 1 times pi. And this will always give you antiphase and perfect destructive interference. So this is the principle of superposition. When two waves of the same kind meet, the resultant displacement is the vector sum of the displacements of each of the waves. You are just straightforwardly adding together whatever amplitude the wave has at that point. One of the important considerations in superposition or interference, you can use those words pretty much interchangeably, is whether the waves are coherent or not. You need to understand what coherent means. This is the actual definition of coherence. Two waves are considered to be coherent when they have a constant phase relationship. Now, you read in a lot of places two waves of the same frequency are coherent. That is true, but that isn't the condition for coherence because they're having the same frequency as more a consequence of the coherence rather than its definition. So if they have a constant phase relationship now, it doesn't mean they have to be in phase. They can be in antiphase and be coherent. As long as their phase relationship, the fact that they're in antiphase, doesn't change over time. In order to meet that condition, yes, they have to be of the same frequency but it's the phase relationship that matters. And so here we can see the waves at the top here are perfectly coherent. You can see they're in phase and they stay in phase. At the bottom, we have non-coherent waves. They range in frequency and therefore wavelength. They're not all in step all the time. If you get two sources of different frequencies 
interfering. You're not going to get a stable superposition pattern. In other words, a resultant wave that remains the same over time. If you have two sources at the same frequency, whether they're in or out of phase with each other, they will produce a stable superposition pattern because they're coherent, so their phase relationship does not change. We will be doing a lot more about the various kinds of interference or superposition that you can get. But for now, I'm going to look at one specific type. And that is stationary waves. These are also called standing waves, and they are caused by interference between two waves, but in a special situation. The waves are coherent, but they are being reflected off a solid boundary. So they're traveling in opposite directions, and when waves are reflected, they get a 180 degree change in phase. So the reflected wave is flipped over so that it interferes with the wave that's incoming. So if you have a solid surface like that, you have an object producing the wave, you've got your incoming wave along a string, for example. When it reflects there, you get a 180 degree change and it interferes with the following wave coming after it. And you get a pattern that looks a bit like this. Now, as you can see, the red and green waves are, the red is incoming, it's being reflected at X over here on the right hand side and the green is traveling back in the opposite direction. And if you watch this carefully, you'll see every time the crest of the green meets the crest of the red, you get a maximum wave in the blue. The blue is the resulting wave. And when a crest of green meets a trough in red, it drops down to zero. And so it keeps producing this pulse of maxima and minima. The maximum oscillation point is what we call an antinode. And the minimum oscillation point in here is what is called a node. And you can see that the wave increases and decreases in its maximum oscillation as the two waves meet. Now, this is a much slowed down version than the one that you would see in a lab. When you see in a lab, the maximum is increasing and decreasing so quickly that it actually looks a bit like this. It looks as if the string forms a complete loop. So if you look at the top diagram here, you form this complete loop. So we have our antinode where you get our maximum. And remember, your string is going up and down from that all the time. And these here are our nodes. And again, take a little time to follow the red and the green waves so that you can understand exactly how each point of amplitude on the blue wave is being created by the vector addition of the amplitudes of the waves as they pass through each other. So the principle of superposition still applies here. You need to be able to describe exactly how a stationary wave is formed. And this is a very, very common question. Some version of it comes up very, very often. So let's have a look at what your standard answer should be. Depending on the context, you might add in context-related parts to this, but the first thing you say is that a wave and its reflection meet and superposition or interference. Again, the words are interchangeable. You can use either one occurs when the waves are in antiphase. You get destructive interference, which leads to our nodes. And when they're in phase, constructive interference occurs, which gives us maximum amplitude at the antinodes. Now, those are the six points that you must make every time you are describing how a stationary wave is formed. It does not matter what the context is. There are hundreds of different contexts. You just have to remember to mention the fact that there's superposition, the fact that they're in antiphase and that leads to destructive, the fact that they're in phase gives you constructive and how nodes and antinodes match up to those situations. This is the experimental setup. You attach a vibration generator to a piece of string and obviously that moves up and down creating a stationary wave along the string, which then reflects back here, and you get your nodes and antinodes being formed much more evenly than I've shown you here. The difference between a stationary wave and a progressive wave is that a stationary wave does not transfer energy from one place to another. It's trapped within this stationary wave, whereas progressive waves do transfer energy from one place to another. One thing you do need to be aware of that comes up occasionally and that is the idea that down here, 
you'll get a perfect node. Whereas over here towards this end of the string, you won't get perfect zeros here. And that's because, remember, those zeros are being produced because you get absolute cancellation of crest width trough. In order for that to happen, the energy of the incoming wave and the energy of the reflected wave that it meets has to be the same. But let's remember that the wave is traveling across, reflecting off that boundary and traveling back. So right here, just at the boundary, this is where the incoming wave and the reflected wave that are interfering with each other have the closest amplitudes because they've lost very little energy just in that reflection. Whereas if you think about what is happening here, that's the incoming wave. It then travels all the way over to the right and then comes all the way back before interfering with another wave that's coming over. It's lost a lot of energy as it's traveled that distance. So it won't be exactly the same amplitude as the incoming wave. And so you won't get a perfect zero. You'll get a small amount of variation around that zero. The next thing you need to know about are the different frequencies that is going to form stationary waves on a string. And you can see this animation here. We've got the single loop. We've got a double loop. And again, this is much slowed down. So we are seeing the string vibrating up and down. In reality, this would look like a whole loop. And then you've got the situation where you get a triple loop. These only happen at certain what are called resonant frequencies of the string. And the first resonant frequency, or the fundamental frequency, is when the length of the string is equal to a half the wavelength. So you can imagine the wave comes over, it's exactly done half a wavelength by the time it reaches the other side, and then it reflects back and you get this perfect single loop on the string. Here, you can see we get one full wave on the string before it's reflected back. So here, the length is equal to the lambda. And that is the second resonant frequency, or second harmonic. And here, our length is one and a half. We can see clearly there's one and a half wavelengths of the wave along that string. So our first resonant frequency, our second resonant frequency, and our third resonant frequency. And of course, there are many more, because you can increase the frequency, decrease the wavelength, and at just those points where whole or half numbers of those wavelengths fit along the length of that string, you will get a resonant frequency and you'll get a standing wave. This again is what it looks like in reality when you do the experiment. There's our first resonant frequency at the top, a single loop, second resonant frequency, two loops, three loops, it will continue on, four loops, five loops, etc. as you decrease the wavelength and increase the frequency. The last thing you need to know about is how quickly do these waves move along a string? And this is super important for all stringed instruments. And if you play a stringed instrument, you will know that you have different weights or masses of strings. You've got on a violin, for example, you can see there are four strings. One very, very thin one, one very, very thick one, and then two intermediate ones between. You also know that up at the top of the violin, you can tighten or loosen those strings. And that tells you that the tension in the string is important to the note that's being played, therefore the frequency that is produced by this string. So we've got two factors here. We've got the mass of the string per unit length, and we've got how tight the string is or its tension. And this is an equation that is given to you. V is equal to root T over mu. There is a core practical that goes along with this, and I will do that in another video, but you need to be able to play with this equation. This V here is the speed, and so we'll use that version of our wave equation, where V is equal to F lambda. That means that you can replace this V with F lambda. A little bit of rearranging, and we can see that F would be equal to 1 over lambda times T over mu. Now we know that when the frequency is equal to the fundamental frequency, that is when you get one loop on your string, then lambda is equal to two times the length of the string, or the length of the string is half lambda. So we can say then that our fundamental frequency, our FO, is going to be equal to one over two times the length of the string, because remember at FO you get a single loop, which means the length of the string is half the wavelength, times T over mu. Now that is not given to you. 
but you may have to combine those two equations and find out what the fundamental frequency of a particular string is. The other thing this tells us, of course, is that the frequency that's produced when you play a musical instrument depends on the length of the string, and this is why. When you play a violin, you change where you put your fingers along so that you're changing the length of the string and therefore the frequency of the note produced. So it's a combination of the mass per unit length of the string, how much tension there is in it, and its length that produces all the different variations of frequency that you use in order to play a musical instrument. If you want to explore this in the lab, you use a setup like this. Once again, a vibration generator, and this mass here is used to vary the tension in the string. But again, I will do a whole video on Core Practical 7, so please do watch out for that.